Hello everyone and welcome to the salon where we invite guests to take their most interesting ideas out of the lecture halls and into the common rooms. My name is Joshua Tiborowski Monrad and I'm here today with Professor Laurie Santos who is a professor of psychology and cognitive science and the head of Silliman College. Welcome Professor Santos, it's an honor to have you here. Thanks for having me. Alright, so what I would like to discuss today is the psychological science of a good life. Mm -hmm. um, and this is something that you'll be teaching about in the spring of 2018. That's so right. first off, could you briefly summarize the focus of this class and say a bit about what has motivated you to want to teach this course? Yeah, so this is the class I'm most excited to teach, I think in my 15 years of teaching here. And the reason is I think it's a class that's really necessary. So the goal of the class is to teach about the science and the practice of having a good life, like what you can do to be happier, live a more fulfilling life, and so on. And I realize that it's a class that's really necessary because Yale students are not as happy as folks often think. Um, I think students can sometimes find themselves really lost, not really know like how to structure their time, how to think about a career, how to think about the big picture. And the sad thing is that Yale, we don't often have time to do that. And so the goal of the course is really to present the science on like what makes us happier, what makes a good life, what should we really be thinking about when we make these decisions, but also to give students the space to actually practice those good practices. Um, we're developing an app. The Center for Teaching and Learning is developing an app um, for the class um, known as Rewise. You can rewire your habits. And the hope is that this is a class where students won't just like learn content about the science of happiness. They'll really be able to put it into practice. Um, I'll be able to put it into practice. I'll be able to live a happier life and so on. So, so I'm super excited about it and really hope a lot of students will take it. Interesting. So on one hand, um, you'll have, you mentioned uh, basing your teaching on rigorous scientific research, mm -hmm. but at the same time it seems intuitively challenging to study the concept of happiness in a lab. So um, how does one study happiness? Um, yeah, it's tricky. I think if you, if you don't know about the work, it might seem like how could you even ask people if they're really happy and so on. But the amazing thing about a lot of the research is it suggests if you just ask people if they're happy, they're usually pretty accurate about it. And that rating that people give when they say, are you happy, you say, oh, I'm happy, a 10 out of you know, 20 or something, that rating often correlates with other kinds of things that we think predict happiness. So it seems like even though it sounds like a hard thing to study, you know, how can you put happiness under the microscope, it seems like it's really easy to do. You just ask people. It's pretty straightforward. All right. So if you could correct um, one conception or misconception about happiness mm -hmm. that is widely held, which one would it be? Yeah, I guess if I could correct one misconception, it would be that our mind is delivering to us accurate information about what we really want. The worst thing about our minds is that we tend to miswant things. There are things that we seek out that we crave that are just not going to make us happy. And there are other things that are totally going to make us happy if we engage in those practices, but we don't have like wanting mechanisms to seek them out. So what do you think has been the most significant findings in this area in recent time? I think some of the most significant findings have to do with these cases where the thing that people really think we might want, we just don't. Um, one of the most famous ones is salary. We often think that having a job that pays us a ton of money is really going to increase our happiness. And it does a little bit, but not nearly the extent to which we think. Um, these studies on our misperceptions, our, our messed up affective forecasts, are the ones that I find most powerful because they're really updating like what we should really be going for in life, what really should matter to us, but kind of doesn't. In terms of the course you'll be teaching, what is, like, if there's a take-home point, one of the many points, I'm sure there is, mm -hmm. that you really hope hits home with the students and resonates with them and they take it, all, you know, beyond the course? The biggest take-home is this idea that merely knowing what's going to make us happy is not really enough. Like, you can know that meditation helps you, you can know that you're supposed to exercise, you can know that salary doesn't matter, you can know all that stuff, but unless you put those things into practice, nothing's going to change. And that's why as part of the course we have all these ways of rewiring your habits that students are supposed to do during the course. So not just learning about the science, they have a space to put it into practice. Um, the sad thing is just knowing all this stuff doesn't help you out. You actually have to do the work. It's kind of a bummer, but you right. actually have to do the work and hopefully the class will give students space to do that. If you had the chance to pose a question to your future 90-year-old version of yourself, mm. what would that question be and why? I think I would want to know what's going on in the country right now. I think, you know, with all the 
um, kind of divisiveness in politics. Um, I'm just not sure where we're heading. And I, if I had a crystal ball, if I could ask my future self, like, what happened? Like, what happened in, like, 2020? Like, you know, how did this all wind up? I think that would be really interesting to know um, and might affect some of the choices I'm making now. So what about Yale students impresses you the most and what frustrates you the most? Mm. I think the thing about Yale students that impresses me the most is that um, you're very demanding. Um, I think that uh, Yale students like have a clear idea of like what's fair and what's not fair, what's right and what's not right, and they hold people to that. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the debates that happen on campus about things like free speech and who should say things and so on, um, a lot of them boil down to Yale students holding people to a higher standard. And I think we can debate the form of that, but ultimately having that higher standard for social justice and um, the kinds of identities that should be protected and the kinds of ways we should live, like, I actually admire that a ton. Um, what frustrates me the most about Yale students is the fact that I see them going through their time here at Yale and, and wasting it, wasting it by filling their day with all this stuff and not having the time and space to, you know, take an interesting walk with some new person they meet or just have the space to, like, walk around and think about things or to, like, process or they just don't have the time to enjoy this place and they're not enjoying this place. And as somebody who looks back at my college years fondly and, you know, wish I could snap my fingers and go back to that, um, I'm scared that there are all these Yale students in this generation are going to wake up 20 years from now and be like, what was I thinking? Um, and so I want to you know, shake them and be like, no, enjoy it now. You're missing it. Come back. For our final question, here's mm -hmm. one from our previous guest, Professor mm -hmm. Shelley Kagan. I'm scared um, of this Shelley Kagan question. <laughs> by the way. So uh, he asked, um, and he didn't know he, who the guest would be, mm -hmm. but he asked, um, why should any person choose your particular field, so that is psychology and cognitive science, mm -hmm. uh, why should they study that? Oh, field? that's an easy one. That's such an easy one from, from <laughs> Shelley. Um, I mean, my field study is this big question about what it means to be human, right? Like, and how we should live our life. We get scientific answers to this key feature of, like, what makes us happy. This is a thing that human thinkers have been thinking about and wondering about since we had the kind of human mind that could wonder about this stuff. And we have a scientific way to answer those questions. We have this, like, unique way of getting insight into these things. Like, I can't imagine wanting to be anything else. Okay. And, of course, we would like you <laughs> to pose a question to our next guest. I think I would ask, if you could develop a new prize, like a Nobel Prize in a new field that you think was really going to give us some insight into how humans should behave, what would that Nobel Prize be in? So like, not just like medicine or physics or chemistry, you get a new one, what should it be in? Okay. And extra credit to that faculty member if they don't pick their own field. Thank you very much. Um, from the Salon, uh, this has been Joshua tiborowski monrad with Professor Lawrence Santos. Um, Thank you for watching and see you next time.